Hello everyone. So again, uh, welcome back to the latest lecture session. Again, as is customary, let us have a quick recap of what we have been up to. So, we have been uh, discussing I believe remediation of contaminated soils or sediments, right? And that context we looked at uh, what do we see excavation and then uh, looking at uh, landfill, what are the different components in a landfill and so on and so forth and some of the ways in which let us say a landfill can, landfill can fail and I think we looked at a few of the practical aspects, right? And we also obviously looked at the different layers uh, within a scientific la landfill and why we need them, right? So, we looked at those aspects. And then we uh, moved on to another particular aspect in this uh, context which is containment, right? So, obviously here uh, we are only talking about containing the relevant uh, containment from being transported to uh, a wider area let us say or away from the source, right? So, again the key is that it is containment, we are only trying to contain the relevant uh, containment. So, obviously here we are talking about restricting the transport of the containment, right? So, how does a particular uh, containment trans what is it transport or how is it going to be transported in the subsurface now, right? Two pathways, one either due to diffusion or one due to advection now, right? Advection as in when we have a net flow of fluid in one direction as in groundwater flowing in a particular direction, this particular contaminant can what do we say uh, that is adsorbed onto soil, let us say can reach equilibrium or desorb into the groundwater and then be transported, right, by that particular groundwater. Or Obviously, because let us say uh, you are going to have a concentration difference, let us say or gradient pardon me, as in let us say at the source location you have very high concentration of your contaminant and a few meters away the concentration is relatively low, right. So, diffusion obviously, right, the other uh, mode of transport of contaminants in our particular context is going to let us say see to it that you know the system ends up like this, right. As in you are going to try to see to it that the concentration or the contaminant is transferred from a location where the concentration is relatively high to a location where the concentration is relatively low, right. That is what it uh, you know tries to do more or less that uh, if you let enough time uh, what do we say or you let the system have enough time you will see that more or less the concentration will be relatively uh, the same throughout the particular system. Again that is one of the driving forces let us say for. Uh, diffusion now, right? So, let us just look at what we have here. So, we have flux due to advection, right? And we also have flux due to diffusion, right? Flux due to diffusion. So, due to ad advection, obviously, we uh, mentioned that it is going to be depend upon the Darcy's velocity, right? Into times concentration, right? So, again, Darcy's velocity that is going to be equal to the hydraulic conductivity into the gradient and g gradient right? So, that is something that we have. Again Darcy's velocity let us say how can I understand that in practical terms let us say I can say that it is also equal to let us say u equal to the flow rate by the total cross sectional area, right? So, more or less though uh, as you understand this is if at least I can uh, use layman's terms uh, what do you say it is like the normalized uh, what do we say velocity as in if this is the cross sectional area through which the groundwater is flowing, right? Obviously, the groundwater does not have this much area to flow through, right? It has relatively lesser area. Why is that? Obviously, because this cross sectional area, let us say, or if I take length L, this volume is filled with soil, right? And some spore, pore space is filled with your water here, right? So, we are only concerned with uh, that particular pore space, right? So, obviously, porosity needs to be taken into account. And the groundwater, as you know, can only move through that particular uh, area that is available in the form of uh, pore space, let us say, right? or free air space, I mean here it is not air because you have ground water obviously out there. So, but uh, we are looking at Darcy's velocity or the total uh, what is area, right, across the entire area. So, the actual velocity or the uh, seepage velocity through these pores is obviously going to be higher, right. So, that is something that uh, you can look at. So, if I say u is equal to q by porosity times a, so this u will now be equal to the seepage velocity, right, that is something to keep in mind. Anyway, flux due to advection, right, this is how we can calculate that and flux due to diffusion, right. Again, uh, if I look at the uh, normalized and so on and so forth, right, it is porosity times flux due to the pores and again uh, not due to the pores, flux through the pores and what is flux again, what are the units now? It is like mass of the contaminant per area per time, right. So, here this is per uh, the pore space area and this is for the total area, right? So, obviously, thus I need to multiply this particular uh, 
uh, flux through the pores by the porosity to be able to end up with uh, the flux, the total flux let us see right, not flux, the normalized flux over the entire area let us see right. And let us just check that I guess right, if that is true, there is porosity is equal to let us say pore volume let us say by uh, total area let us say or total volume pardon me, total volume right into let us say this will be equal to mass per area of the pores let us say into time. So, either pore volume or I can multiply that by uh, you know length and such too right and then transform that. So, yes that will end up being something like mass per total area let us say or area into time. Earlier it was area of the number pores let us say if I can say that right and then here this is how we end up with. So, that is why obviously we need to use porosity out here. So, in this context uh, let us look at uh, one particular example. Uh, let us say think of a system where let us say this is the top view now, you have the top view, you have the top view right and let us say uh, you have a spill here, your soil is contaminated with this particular uh, what do we say TCE let us say and you have ground water flowing in this direction and you want to contain this particular uh, waste such that it is not transported over a you know wider area let us say right. So, what can you do? You can put in a containment barrier here let us say right. Okay, I obviously, it can have it uh, in this manner or you know obviously cover it entirely or such, but typically you know you see such shapes here right. So, again here you have this and here you use your waste and you have your containment barrier here. This is the top view obviously right. So, here let us say uh, we can use bentonite clay and, and so on and so forth. So, obviously, what are the ways that uh, you know uh, the containment can still be transported? Let us say if I have this entirely here let us say right. So, through diffusion let us say if let us say now let us assume for sake of uh, ease let us say that this entire uh, volume is filled with that contaminant now. So, because the concentration of the contaminant on this side of the barrier is less than the con, uh, concentration of the contaminant on the other side of the barrier due to diffusion the contaminant will want to be transported in this way yes. So, that is something that is always going to be there. And if there is still some ground water flowing through as in you are going to decrease the ground water flow or the transport due to advection it cannot be 0 right you know. So, let us say the you are still going to have some advection let us say let me use this kind of an arrow mark advection right. So, you are still going to have some advection let us say right. So, let us see how these particular uh, fluxes due to uh, advection and diffusion compare let us say when we use bentonite clay or such right. And let us go to the relevant aspects that I have. So, let us say here I have some data. So, porosity of 0.5, effective diffusion coefficient that includes both dispersion and diffusion, let us say I guess is 2 into 10 power minus 9. So, if you remember, how did we end up with this? DE is equal to the diffusion coefficient by tau, right? And tau gives us an idea about the tortuosity of this particular uh, system, let us say, uh, the tortuosity factor, right? Uh, so because as you increase the tau, right? Uh, that means that what does that mean that you know the path is more tortuous now anyway that is something you see out here and uh, hydraulic conductivity delta C let us say as an as for example, I have the top view right and if my contaminant is within this particular area and this is my barrier let us say and the barrier thickness is let us say 1 meter 1 meter. So, delta C is you know the concentration here or inside the uh, barrier at this point minus the concentration at this point. So, that is delta C here and L delta L is 1 or 1 meter here 1 meter right and energy gradient is uh, 1 meter per meter I guess right. So, that is what we have here. So, we will now try to calculate the 1 due to or the flux due to uh, advection that you know is U times C U is K into I into C right. So, let us have uh, that here k is 10 power minus 9 meters per second. Again as I mentioned this is for clay typically for bentonite clay you do have uh, such a level of uh, hydraulic conductivity and gradient is 1 meter per meter times concentration here let us say. So, for sake of our ease of calculation assume that it is uh, 0 here and that it is 100 here right into C is then 100 right 100 milligram per liter right. So, I can then uh, calculate that let us say and J due to 
or flux due to diffusion pardon me is what is it now? It is porosity times the effective diffusion coefficient let us say times dc by dx, dc by dx is nothing but how is uh, c changing with x or in this case I will say into delta c by delta x right. So, that is equal to porosity is 0 0.5 we have that out here right and uh, effective diffusion coefficient or dispersion coefficient let us say is 2 into 10 power minus 9 meter square per second right that is what we have out here and delta c is the change and concentration is 100 milligram per liter that is what we see here, here it is 100 milligram per liter here it is 0. So, delta C is 100 minus C is 0, 100 milligram per liter per delta L as in or this change in uh, length. So, that is equal to 1 minus 0 meters right. So, I have this out here right. So, what do I have here obviously units need to be looked at meter meter cancel out. So, this is obviously in liters right. Uh, so, we have 10 power minus 9 meter per second into 1 meter per meter right and into 100 milligram right. So, milligram is 10 power minus 3 uh, gram I guess right by 10 power minus 3 meter cube right 10 power minus 3 meter cube because 1 meter cube is 1000 liter right. So, that is going to be 100 gram per uh, liter into 100 gram per liter. So, how what is the what are the units not liter pardon me now units are meter cube right this is a, uh, equal to 1 gram per meter cube 1 milligram per uh, liter is equal to 1 gram per meter cube that is what we have here. So, I end up with 10 power minus 9 grams of that particular contaminant per meter square area per second. So, this is what we end up with for advection and for diffusion let us see what we have 0.5 into 2. So, that is 1 into 10 power minus 9 uh, meter square per second into 100 milligram per liter is again 100 gram per meter cube as we discussed earlier divided by 1 meter right divided by 1 meter. So, again the units and such can, can cancel out and if I look at it obviously it is equal to 10 power minus 7 grams per meter square per second right. Again so, we now calculate the flux due to advection and flux due to diffusion and this kind of scenario and keep in mind that this is for bentonite clay you know these uh, factors are typically for bentonite clay and I believe the diffusion coefficient is for a chlorinated solvent right uh, the example uh, here is for a chlorinated solvent I believe uh, the diffusion coefficient or dispersion coefficient through clay now. So, again uh, what do we have here let us just look at what we have. So, for what do we say uh, bentonite clay let us say the example that we looked at you see that you know you still have advection right or you know there is some transport due to advection, but it is so low that you know the flux due to advection and flux due to diffusion are more or less uh, same. Typically as you know the flux due to advection is far higher than the flux due to diffusion. But if you have a relatively well uh, constructed uh, uh, containment barrier you are going to bring down the advection to such an extent right that you know it is so low that it is uh, you know in the same order of as the flux due to uh, diffusion pardon me right. So, that is what we have here. So, what does this tell us that 10 power minus 7 grams of the relevant containment will be transported through a meter square of the relevant area of the barrier per second right that is what you have here. So, for example, let us say I think some people sometimes have uh, issues in understanding what flux is maybe I should have discussed this uh, in maybe a bit more detail uh, what we say earlier, but think of this let us say the door here is open and you know wind is blowing dust in right. So, I want to uh, get an idea about how much mass is coming through that door per time right. So, what is that it is nothing but flux right how much mass of the dust is coming through that door through that particular door or that particular area per time right that is flux you know that is going to obviously give you an idea about the transport let us say and that is what we see here, here out here right. So, we are talking about containment, containment right and that context we looked at the characteristics of barriers right that is what we looked at. So, obviously what do we need to look at we need to look at let us say the uh, transport due to advection, transport due to diffusion and so on and so forth typically bentonite clay itself 
uh, it is a pretty good uh, way or you know a containment barrier but obviously it depends upon how you construct or compact that particular layer and such right and there are some issues with respect to optimum moisture content and so on and so forth but again it boils down to how much uh, or how well you are restricting the advective transport and the diffusive transport right. So what are the different types let us say? So we can have just a soil cap for example this is typically used let us say if you have relatively remote locations let us say and uh, uh, you know the chances of contam not contamination let us say uh, ingestion or the risk to a particular uh, person in the locality is relatively less let us say but still you do not want the contaminant to be spread over a wider area let us say or the costs are too high you know different ways or not different ways different scenarios let us say when you do not want to put in a lot of money cleaning up the scenario what can you do? You can put a soil cap over that such that whenever there is rainfall let us say at least you know there is not going to be uh, this contaminant transport. So soil cap is one way and uh, obviously people look at bentonite clay or clay barriers right clay barriers. So obviously the location is it above you know beside underneath rarely underneath or you know around this particular source or such depends upon the site conditions and the uh, way in which let us say the ground water or you know uh, surface water runoff is uh, going to uh, behave let us say right. So we have those and typically we can also have uh, geomembrane, geomembrane right we can also have that. So there are different types of these particular uh, caps and uh, such or the containment uh, barriers let us say or containment layers. So for in some cases obviously it is not going to be diffusion it is going to be permeation let us say or permeability or permeation. So then the flux is equal to J times the permeation coefficient if I can call that times delta C right. So that is uh, one particular aspect that you need to be uh, you know aware of anyway right. So again containment you know these are the aspects that we look at and sometimes used right. So then we will uh, move on to another aspect let us say which would be uh, which is one of the most widely used uh, methods for treating or you know uh, remediating contaminated soils and sediments that is solidification and stabilization right. What do we have here? We have solidification and So what do we have here? Uh, we have a particular method uh, which goes by or which we refer to as solidification and stabilization right. So we look at it in a bit more detail in a few minutes but let us just try to understand what it is that uh, we have out here. So they are slightly self explanatory. So there are two aspects obviously. So you are solidifying it and then stabilizing it right. So when we are talking about solidifying a particular uh, mixture or such you know what are we trying to do? We are trying to improve the physical properties or the characteristics of that particular mixture now. We are solidifying it right. We are improving the or affecting the physical characteristics or such as uh, strength and such typically unconfined compared to strength and so on. So typically we look at physical characteristics or improving the physical characteristics or strength of the mixture through solidification. So stabilization is more or less you know making the relevant contaminant either less toxic or immobile right. So the first aspect is you are solidifying it right giving it or imparting it more strength. Second aspect is you are trying to see to it that the contaminant within this particular mixture is or becomes either less toxic or it becomes immobile or is not free to let us say uh, uh, be transported right or is less mobile obviously right. So I believe I have a few slides here let us look at uh, what I have here. So again uh, what do we have here? So typically most widely used again so here we used to prevent migration let us say from contaminant media that is something that we obviously discussed yes. As I mentioned here solidification typically for the physical strength right for the physical strength and again how does that work binds the contaminated media, media pardon me with a reagent right. We will look at what reagents we typically use. So here again the key is that we are talking about bind right. We are binding the contaminated media with a reagent. We will look at what they are but obviously the key is that uh, we are trying to bind the media here right. And thus increasing or increasing typically improving the uh, physical care properties. And as we discussed stabilization that reduces the leachability of a waste, leachability as in we are making it more immobile right. 
For example, how do you define, let us say, whether a particular waste is uh, toxic or not toxic, right? For example, when we looked at the relevant laws, let us say we saw that, uh, you know, we have at least in India, let us say, uh, hazardous waste and management and other uh, rules and such, right? I think 2016 or such. There, obviously, uh, how do you classify between, let us say, if a waste can be uh, disposed in a municipal landfill or, you know, needs to be followed. Uh, by the relevant regulations and needs to be dumped in a uh, hazardous waste landfill or such. How do I go about that, right? So, obviously, let us say if I am not sure, I need to conduct the TCLP test, right? The Toxicity Characteristic Leaching Procedure Test, right? So, what is this about to refresh your memory? So, for example, this tries to or this tr test tries to mimic the worst case scenario that can happen to a particular uh, waste, let us say. And the worst case scenario is that your particular waste ends up in a dump or a municipal dump, let us say, or a municipal landfill, uh, I will use the term dump for now. And during the anaerobic decomposition of this particular dump, you are going to have acids formed, uh, let us say, and that acid is going to, let us say, so in this anaerobic dump where your waste end up in, the hazardous waste, you have acids being formed and acids come in contact with your relevant uh, waste. And now, you know, typically, let us say, we are talking about heavy metals, let us say your contaminants are going to change phase from let us say uh, the soil phase to the aqueous phase, right? Uh, typically because the pH is low because of your uh, acids that are formed and then this leachate let us say is now going to uh, contaminate the ground water and then be transported over a wider area. So, that is the worst case scenario that this TCLP test tries to mimic let us say, right? So, what do we do out there? If you remember, we break down the relevant uh, what do we say mixture into I think uh, size 9 mm or less, right? less than 9 mm particle size, right? And I think we take the uh, 1 gram to 20 ml, right? 1 gram of the relevant uh, compound, right? Or uh, your waste to 20 ml of the particular acetic acid based uh, mixture or leaching uh, leachate here, right? And what do we do? We put them in a particular box in this particular ratio, right? And then end over end mixing, end over end as in, you know, I have this, uh, let us say end, end over end mixing for 24 hours and then we test the relevant concentration of the relevant compounds in that leachate and if the concentration of the relevant compounds in the leachate is higher than the prescribed limits, then we describe that particular waste or mixture as hazardous waste, right? So, that is some background here regarding the TCLP test, right? So, why is that that we are uh, looking at or why have we just looked at TCLP test? Because the key is that, you know, how do we classify waste as hazardous waste by conducting the TCLP test. And what does the TCLP test do? It tries to see to it that, you know, it, the contaminant changes phase, let us say, from being adsorbed onto the relevant, uh, what is it, solids or such into the leachate, right? You are trying to improve the, uh, uh, what do we say, if I can say, or trying to make the contaminant more mobile. So, here the stabilization in a way, you know, tries to work against that by decreasing the leachability of a waste or making the waste more immobile now, right? So, in solidification stabilization, there are different ways, but one way is obviously such that you maintain the conditions in such a way that even if you conduct the TCLP test on this particular solidified and stabilized waste, it will not be classified as a hazardous waste. Again, different aspects, we will come back to that again, right? So, let us look at uh, what else we have here. Primarily used for hazardous waste sites, yes, uh, there are some uh, aspects as in uh, radioactive waste obviously are not classified as hazardous waste in our uh, Indian context, there is a separate law or you know different uh, kinds of regulations, but solidification and stabilization, yes, is a good way to again uh, look at let us say uh, radioactive or remediating uh, sites contaminated with radioactive material and such, but typically used for at or you know remediating sites contaminated with hazardous waste, right? So, let us uh, move on out here. So, what are the different aspects obviously? So, first obviously we need to conduct the treatability studies or the bench scale studies and then look at the relevant performance that is obvious I guess, right? So, not all type of contaminants can be uh, treated by uh, what do we say this particular solidification and stabilization, right? So, think of which contaminants let us say are easier to be binded and also uh, easier to make uh, them more immobile and which contam contaminants are not. Typically, we look at heavy metals, easy to let us say bind them or let us say at least make them immobile by raising the pH and precipitating them out or such or adsorption onto the relevant matrix or such. We will come back to those later, right? So, again type of contaminants is an issue. For example, typically organic contaminants or hydrocarbons and such obviously not a good way. 
but for some organics yes you can do that but typically for heavy metals or inorganic solidification and stabilization is a pretty good technique now right obviously cost considerations depending upon the site right uh, again site considerations the amount of binder that needs to be used right and these are aspects so we look at the long term uh, performance right or permanence in this uh, context as in how stable is it in the long term right is it unchanged or such is it uh, more or less permanent or can i think of this solution as uh, being a permanent solution or a short term fix or such those aspects obviously i can or uh, should uh, look at right so typically again uh, aspects are uh, type of contaminants and then long term uh, permanence let's say right these are the aspects we need to look at so let's move on typically again as we looked at there are two aspects uh, sometimes you need not look at solidification let's say if the physical characteristics of the relevant waste are pretty good right but typically you go for both solidification and stabilization right they go hand in hand so let's look at what we have looked uh, what we have here so it's again that you bind a contaminant media with the reagent right and what do we do we increase the typically the unconfined compressive strength right uh, or the compressive strength anyway right we try to increase the compressive strength we increase its uh, not increase pardon me we decrease its permeability right why is that an issue for example if the mixture or your particular uh, waste is way too permeable obviously then your uh, what do we say uh, uh, ground water or any other leachate let's say that you know can uh, permeate through this particular mixture right so there will be the greater chances of uh, what we say contaminant transport from that particular uh, mixture into your particular leachate now right so thus you want to decrease your permeability right you want to decrease the, let's say the uh, ability of that particular fluid to flow through or permeate through your particular uh, mixture here so we are going to try to decrease the permeability right and also such that in this process of solidification we also try to encapsulate the contaminant to form a solid material right so you are trying to let's say if i can use layman's terms to capture uh, or hold them in place them as in the contaminants in place so that's one aspect so then stabilization as we looked at right you know these are typically chemical reactions right uh, solidification we are looking at the physical properties stabilization what are we looking at typically the chemical properties by trying to make the uh, contaminant either less mobile or immobile or reducing the toxicity let us say right. So, again as we discussed uh, you know making it less uh, mobile or immobile or reducing the leachability of waste right. So, again as I mentioned these two go hand in hand as in chemically immobilize the waste right. For example, you have a heavy metal let us say right and you raise the pH high enough it is going to precipitate out right or precipitate into a solid phase and once you precipitate into solid phase and again carry out solidification let us say you are going to maybe encapsulate it uh, right or you can have adsorption onto the relevant matrix uh, the cement matrix or such right. So, that is something we will come back to that again. So, again also decrease its solubility right that is something again the, all these three aspects go hand in hand now right. So, other than this obviously we can add some admixtures that you know also have relevant reactions such that they can decrease the toxicity but that depends obviously on the type of contaminant right. So, I guess with that I am uh, what do we say uh, running out of time. So, we will look at this in greater detail in the next session but again uh, this is one particular remediation technique that is the most widely used technique all over the world but certainly I have not come across a lot of cases or at least very few cases in India but that is typically because of less uh, what do we say uh, awareness uh, if I may say so right there should be some technology transfer and such. So, I am assuming uh, the people looking at this video at least can look at the relevant sites and see if uh, solidification and stabilization is something that is applicable or such right. Again I will uh, continue this session and uh, you know the relevant aspects in the next session and thank you.